police report. Oh, wow. <laughs> Case has a question. Specific. What, does the letters as well or no? No. No, okay. That's, I have some of those photos. Oh, do you? Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Oh, okay, great. All right. All right. This is our first Facebook Live, so bear with us a little bit. I'm Connie Walker. I'm the host of Missing and Murdered, uh, Finding Cleo, which is a podcast here at CBC News. And, and I'm Marnie Luke. I'm one of the producers on the podcast with Connie. Um, so we're really excited to do this. Um, the podcast just we released the last episode uh, on Monday, so all 10 are available now for people to binge if you haven't had a chance to listen. Um, and we know that like there has been so much great feedback throughout, it's been rolling out over the last month, and I know there are a lot of questions about how we did it and how everything worked out, so we'll get right to it. Um, Yumi Webster asks on Twitter, did you ever find out how Cleo's family came to be so misinformed about what happened to her? So that's, a, I guess I should start off by saying <laughs> there are going to be spoilers in this Facebook Live because yes. we're going to assume that some people have listened to the podcast. If you haven't yet, you might want to stop watching or mute it or just join us. We'll try to give you a heads up though when there is going to be a specific spoiler. Um, so this is about how the family came to be misinformed about what happened to her. And so I guess we should start off by saying what they believed for, for so long. They had heard that Cleo was trying to hitchhike back home to Saskatchewan and that she was picked up and assaulted and killed um, while she was trying to get back home after being adopted into Arkansas. And what we discovered through the podcast is that she was actually adopted into New Jersey. Um, and you know, it was a very different story. And the, what did we hear about her family and how did she, how did they? they yeah, I mean, the short answer to the question, did we ever find out how they were so misinformed? The answer is no. I mean, no, I apparently her mother, Cleo's mother, Lillian, received a letter of mm -hmm. some sort, a letter from someone, and that she was holding that letter when she showed up at a powwow, I think sometime yeah. in the spring. Um, and if we could have found out who that letter came from, that might have, have helped. We thought maybe it was social services. Um, but we, we don't know how they got that information or if there was even any truth to Arkansas. Like, yeah. who knows if she maybe went to Arkansas briefly and was in a foster family there and then went to New Jersey. We don't but think we don't, so. Yeah, we don't we have any indication. Nothing to suggest that. So. I think part of it is that obviously their mother passed away in 2012 and that, you know, we had tried to talk to as many family members as we could, but a lot of the people who were telling us about what happened to Cleo were children when it happened, so they don't necessarily have direct knowledge. Exactly. Um, so Tiger Lily asks on Twitter, did you ever get access to Cleo's CAS or adoption records after her father signed mm -hmm. the consent, consent form? No, we never did. Um, no, Good we question. never did. Yeah, it was not long after that actually that we went to New Jersey and we were able to um, get access to the police report. Um, so, so that never happened. He didn't. I mean, it's possible that it's still in the works because her father, Sidney, did fill out the paperwork. He sent it to the Saskatchewan government and he did get a letter back confirming that they've received his request, um, but they, uh, to the best of our knowledge, they haven't sent anything to him yet. Okay, Ryan Patterson asks on Twitter. How are we doing? I hope this is going okay. Yeah. Um, Ryan Patterson asks on Twitter, biggest regret during production? Any epic equipment or technology <laughs> or human failures that set you back or made you miss an important moment. Thanks for making this podcast. Oh, I can think of one. Really? Oh, which one? That, I can't remember. I, I have such a bad memory. Yes, If should. we should admit it. Oh, wow. I'm embarrassed to admit it. New oh, Jersey shoot. with oh, Johnny? Yes, yes, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was, that was definitely a regret. Right. Go so, <laughs> so after we found out um, where Cleo's grave was and confirmed that it was in fact Cleo's grave, um, and we didn't know at that point yet, we'd, we'd told the family members and we didn't know yet if there was going to be any, again, spoiler, um, reunion. So eventually Christine and Johnny did meet each other. But we didn't know that that was going to happen and so Johnny wanted to go on his own to visit Cleo's grave. And we thought there was a possibility that that might be the conclusion of the story, that, that yeah. Johnny going to Cleo's grave might be the last scene in effect of the story. But also like just the fact that he went was pretty significant because he Absolutely. had, you know, he was only a couple of hours away from 
where Cleo was living and he had no idea. And so right. we flew down for one day. We flew to be down there. to New Jersey for a day. We convinced our bosses. We said this is a really key moment. We have to capture this, especially with the TV story. It could be sort of the last moment in the TV story. So they agreed to send the two of us with a camera. We are not camera people. We um, should have brought Ed. We should have brought behind the camera right in now. today. Long story short, we got to the cemetery before Johnny. We tried to set up a camera very discreetly off in the bushes so that he could have a private moment without us in his face. Um, and we couldn't get our camera to work. Our camera, it just would not yeah. record. There was it's and we were like, I don't know, we keep pressing the red button. We kept pressing it, and then it, it just didn't work. I mean, he yeah. was recording live on Facebook the whole time, actually. <laughs> so we have, yeah. we could have used that, I guess. Exactly, yeah. So missing Johnny. So that was that was definitely, I mean, I feel like we've, we've made, there have been other equipment things. I've run out of batteries a million times and yeah. memory cards and things like that. Stuff like that. But yeah, missing, going to New Jersey and missing that moment was... Okay, Karen Gales G Galensky asks on Facebook, has Cleo's adopted mother talked to your team since the completion of the podcast or any of the siblings? No, we haven't heard from her. No, we haven't. Um, we, we did, like, we reached out to her to let her know what was happening, but we haven't heard anything from her. Darissa Holiday asks on Facebook, are all of the siblings informed of the truth of Cleo's death and somewhat at peace with it? Mm. Yeah, everyone, everyone knows. I mean, as soon as we found out... Um, and it didn't. We didn't. Um, we didn't record it for the podcast. That when we when we talked to them about um, how she died, uh, but but they all know. And I think that you know. I think it's been a really obviously big year for for everyone. And so um, I th I think that for sure, Christine and Johnny w and and April would say that this has been a positive thing. And this this finding some kind of resolution has been positive. Although. We, we should ask them for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it's also, you know, it's been, it's been kind of an emotional year, so I don't think there's, yeah. This next question just dovetails with this one a little bit, Mo but Monique Dillon asks on Facebook, are there any plans to try to move Cleo's remains to Little Pine? Not, not that we know. I, I know mm -hmm. that they're, they are hoping, her family in Little Pine is hoping to have a ceremony to, um, kind of bring some kind of resolution and to bring her spirit back to Little Pine, but I don't think that, there, that, that involves any kind of physical m moving of anything. Um, yeah, that's yeah, as far that as was know. Christine's sort of stated hope initially that she did want to bring her remains back, and we've talked to her about it since. Christine does Facebook Lives as well. You should check her out on Facebook, Christine Cameron. Um, and she just mentioned the other night in a Facebook Live, at least, that she, it, it doesn't sound like something that she's pursuing that, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, I think the siblings feel she's best where she is. How, do you, how is this pace going? Do people want mm -hmm. us to, like, go faster, up, faster, slower? We're good? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so Audrey asks via CBC Indigenous, thank you so much for the season of Missing Murder. Clear story was very moving. Do you have any plans for season three? See, I was trying to avoid oh, that question. Shoot. Oh, sorry. I to, that's why I skipped <laughs> over that one and went to the next one. It's a really, really easy season answer. Three. We don't have any plans at, no at plans. this point. We don't have any plans outside of after this Facebook Live. I don't know what I'm doing. Who knows? Me neither. <laughs> um, okay. Um, John Vancer asks, or Vancer Cliss asks, Vice, do you consider digging further into death? I was left wanting more. Yeah. So it's funny because I feel like we've heard that a cup from a couple of different places. We felt like um, we we didn't necessarily feel like there were many more questions we could answer. Mm -hmm. um, there there was a detail. Like, there were some details, I guess, in the police report that we didn't include in the final episode. Not because we were trying to build any suspense or insinuate that anything other than than what happened happened, um, but uh, but we didn't necessarily feel like there was much more to dig into necessarily. No. Um, um, yeah, no, I don't know what else to say on that. I mean, yeah, there, there isn't really, I don't know if there's anything in particular, uh, but it's all quite, you know, clear in the, in the police report, and they were definitive in the way that they closed it. I think the language they used was, you know, being it being clear that... Marty has a police report right here, police actually. Report right here, because this, I, I thought this, this might come up, but... In any event, due to all leads being exhausted in this matter, along with the nature of the case, with no question as to the death being that of a suicide, the case is closed. So, and there was, I know that somebody had asked earlier about um, gun residue, and they did yes. find gun residue on Cleo's hands as well, and that was something 
that we didn't necessarily feel like we had to include. Again, not to try to insinuate there was something else that happened, but it really didn't actually occur to me that people would question whether or not um, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's sort of a follow-up similar, do you have any idea who did this? I, I'm sorry, that's Sharon Elgin oh, okay. asking, yeah. which... I don't know what that means. I guess yeah. if, uh, I think, yeah, if, if it's insinuating that there was something else that happened, mm -hmm. we don't have any indication that that's, that that's the case. Right. Uh, Elizabeth Clark on Facebook says, tell us about the music which illustrated mm -hmm. your podcast so perfectly. I'm really happy to talk about this because yes. um, uh, all of the audio production was amazing and was done by um, uh, the audio producer on our podcast, who's Mika Anderson, who was just lovely Fantastic. to work with, and yeah. an audio wizard. I think they should change her title, actually. <laughs> um, and so she, she, you know, is in, she's gives do, deserves all the credit for how good everything sounded in the podcast. Mm -hmm. But the actual theme music. Though, oh, the theme music. I don't know if oh, I'm yes. talking about the theme. There was beautiful music throughout the podcast, That's right, but the yes. theme music by Kai Engel. Kai, Kai Engel, Engel, which Connie found, found out last season. Yeah, late at night. It was like 3 in the morning. Um, <laughs> That's when we do our best work. <laughs> That's when I basically do all my work is at night. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see. Music. Allison Sparling, can you talk about your editorial process for tone? I love that you included details from Cleo's note that made you realize how young she was. The Springsteen song detail made me so emotional. Mm. I know. I felt the same way. I remember. I, I didn't know. I didn't know that he sang that song until I read it in Cleo's letter. Mm. Um, and then I go looked it up on YouTube, and I, I also I was like writing the last episode at my dining room table, listening to that song, and it, it just it was so emotional. Because you do, you do really get a sense that this was a girl, like she was 13 years old and obviously going through so much. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that we necessarily had a process for tone. I mean, I think that we no. just tried to be as sensitive as possible and as transparent as we, we could be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think fortunately with her letters too, I mean, I say fortunately, but I mean, the content in the letters was fairly you know, innocuous teenage things back and forth. I don't feel that there was anything in the letters that like editorially really gave us pause and thought, oh, should we be revealing this or not? Like it was, um, there weren't really any hard decisions there. It was more a decision around maybe whether or not to use that material in the podcast to actually be reading from Cleo's letters. Um, and again, I think we thought because it, it wasn't like deeply personal things she was sharing mm -hmm. that, that it, it seemed like the right thing to do. And it just gave such insight into what was going on mm -hmm. in her life in the weeks before, but also, you know, you know, in, in the days before. Mm -hmm. um, so Melanie Adams on Facebook says, I just want to thank you for sharing this story, and especially to the Smegnus family, mm -hmm. for letting us into their lives and letting us in on such an emotional journey. I'm so glad they were able to find Cleo and hopefully some peace. Um, and yeah, I, I think that it's just been amazing um, to have been, you know, a part of their journey over the last year and to help them tell their their own stories and their sister stories and I've just been in awe of their, um, you know, their strength and, you know, their clarity and the way they can see, the, the way they articulate the bigger picture and how their stories fit into it. It's just, it's been, it's been amazing and I'm so grateful to them for trusting us to help tell Cleo's story. That's absolutely, and to have Christine there as well in New Jersey for the yeah, you know the last few episodes of the podcast. But to have her there really and like driving, it, it became her journey, mm -hmm. and I think we were really pleased with that. To yeah. have her there asking the questions there at the police station. I mean, she's just been such a force throughout this, and yeah, we're immensely thankful that she came to Connie with the story and to the whole family that they trusted us with working on it together. Um. Aaron on Twitter says, in a phone conversation at work yesterday, the woman I was speaking to mentioned as an aside that she had been orphaned and adopted out in the 60s scoop. Listening to Finding Cleo series has deepened my understanding of the intergenerational trauma and cultural loss. Um, I, I've, I feel like I've heard that a couple of times from people who've been listening to the podcast um, who have made a connection in their personal lives, either you know through their work or through people that they know or their own personal experience. 
and I, I think that's you know I think that's it's amazing like it's so gratifying in a way to feel that people are getting a different kind of understanding um, but I know that people who have a personal connection to either the 60 scoop or just the intergenerational trauma that that comes from residential schools and, and colonization I think it's also been difficult for, for them to listen to Cleo's story because it sometimes is a really hard story to hear and uh, so I totally understand some people have sent me messages saying that they can't listen that they you know it's just too much and and I totally understand that and respect that and I feel like you know no pressure from us uh, you know and I think also for people who have a personal experience they might not need mm. somebody to connect the dots in the same way that somebody who doesn't necessarily have that knowledge or that history who has never been taught about it. Um, so we're d I'm just so happy that people are listening and that Cleo's story is is resonating with people. Absolutely. And like, you know, like Tammy's saying it, de sorry, was it Tammy? No. Uh, Aaron said it deepened her understanding. Like to me, some of the most gratifying responses we've gotten back is from, like Connie's saying, people who had no understanding of this. And those are of the 60 scoop or of some of the deeper legacies of residential schools and I think reaching that those audiences non-indigenous audiences who knew nothing about it um, that's been really important and really gratifying to get that feedback from people who yeah this was the first they were learning about these issues um, Tammy Tammy said I think it's the same question were oh. you able to get any information from the government of Saskatchewan or mm. New Jersey about Queen's <laughs> no we have not no. heard back from from no them although I mean once we f once we found Cleo we didn't necessarily go back to um, although we did ask no. for a word file we did and we the New Jersey government actually we've been trying very hard because Johnny wanted them Johnny and, and Christine I think as well um, Cleo's adoption files in New Jersey because that may have revealed a lot as well like mm -hmm. was she ever in Arkansas you know what what was the the process with the the adoption agency in New Jersey um, so there is a process still underway where we're trying to get her files from New Jersey but so far the New Jersey government has not been at all forthcoming with that information um, Kimberly Holman mm -hmm. oh, sorry Kimberly Holloman asks on Facebook how did you come about choosing this story um, yeah, this that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, Christine reached out to us. She sent us the message. Uh, and at that point, I think we were looking for another another case to to investigate for season two of the podcast. We had, we had I think, identified that we were going to do another season and that we were looking for another possible story. So Christine sent, sent us that message. And at the beginning, we didn't necessarily know if it was going to pan out or if there was we were going to be able to find anything. Um, so it was a bit of a leap of faith, and uh, you know, a year later, here we are, or more than a year later, more than a year later, <laughs> more than a year later. Yes. Um, Tina Savea asks on CBC Indigenous. Hi, Tina. I Hi know Tina. her. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any more info on Barry? Um, no. no. Should no. we explain who Barry is? Barry is um, somebody that Cleo mentioned in her letters that she had some kind of relationship with him. He was interviewed by police after she died and turns out um, Cleo said they had uh, a sexual relationship. She told her friends that, that it was a sexual relationship and he was 24 and she was 13 so he was interviewed by police and we include some of that interview in the last episode. Well we, we'd say in the last episode that we tried, we actually went and knocked on his door, um, we tried calling him, we sent him an email, um, voicemail, voicemail um, wrote we, a letter. we wrote a letter, uh, but we have never heard back from, from Barry at all. Nothing more there. But we would love to, love to hear back from him. Yeah. Um, Shantastics asks on CBC Indigenous, how long did it take for you to research and create this amazing story? It was mm. basically a full year, yeah, right? Yeah, we say. started, we did our first interview, I think it was like March 6th or March 8th of 20, in 2017. We traveled to North Bay to interview Christine. And then we launched on March 7th, 2018. Yeah, exactly year, yeah. yeah, so it was, I guess, more than a year. And a lot of it was simultaneous, actually. We can maybe get to some of that in the next question I see or hear from Corinne. But the research and the storytelling, or th the research and the creation of the story was all somewhat simultaneous. It's not like we re spent a long time researching and then put it together. It was all, hand it all sort of went hand in hand. And our other producer who's not here with us right now, Jennifer Fowler did a lot of the research on the background to do with the AIM program 
and the government of Saskatchewan, the Adopt Indian Métis program that resulted mm -hmm. in a lot of these adoptions. And the next question kind of dovetails into that. So it's Corinne Mason asks on Facebook, were you satisfied with Otto Dreger's answer about the complexities of the AIM program? Do you think it was, do you think such a response that it was good and intent speaks to the contemporary issues of the Millennium Group? That's a really good question. I think that, I mean, from my perspective, talking to Otto and his wife Florence, um, uh, you know, it was a very long conversation that we used a section of it, but I really did feel like I had a different understanding of w what people involved in social work and child welfare at the time um, were facing. And so, you know, I, I think that it was really important for us to give them the space to explain their role in, in the 60 Scoop and in the AIM program in particular. Um, and so I feel like, you know, that's, that was really important to include. Um, I think that what was so interesting for me is just how many parallels that, that we see um, in the situation from 40 years ago into what's happening today. today. And so, you know, we have the, the settlement that's just been announced, uh, or not just been, but has been announced between the federal government and si some 60 Scoop survivors, excluding Métis. Um, and, you know, ministers talking about how this was wrong, it should never have happened. Um, and then when we di dove deep into Lillian's story and you really get a sense of how little support she received as a, as a young mother who was obviously going through a lot as a residential school survivor and a single mother and dealing with all kinds of issues, um, you know, you really, you really see the parallels to what's mm -hmm. continuing to happen today. And so, you know, this is a story from 40 years ago, but I think there are so many relevant threads to, to what's still happening. Mm -hmm. These questions keep coming up. I know, they're great questions, like, Yeah, though. they're really good questions. Um, do, uh, Cynthia wants to know, asks on CBC Indigenous, do you have any other families reaching out for you, to you for help in solving similar stories? Um, kind of yes and kind of no. I think that, like, in general, I feel like every, every so often people do reach out with, um, with, with a story or with, with a question. Um, but, yeah, so sometimes, I, I would mm -hmm. say, but, um, but not, not, not no, a ton. No, not a lot. No, definitely not. Oh, here's an interesting one um, from Nana Abba, asks on Facebook. I think she works at CBC. <laughs> Oh, really? You're not allowed to ask questions on these. If you work for CBC, are you? Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll pretend we don't, we don't this know. This is what we I don't want to answer. No, yeah, really. <laughs> Nana Abba wants to know, there was a lot of emotion and psychological stress to witness yeah. in this story. What did you do to take care of yourselves? Um, that's a good, that's a very good question. I feel yes. like, I feel like that's part of like almost another discussion. Um, mm. In a way, just that I think that there are, there are more conversations happening now about as in our profession about how you deal with and manage this kind of stress at work. Um, I don't have a great answer. I mean, I feel like obviously I have an amazing support system. I have uh, a really great family support. Um, and so I rely really heavily on that. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, that's a really good question. I feel like I don't have very good answers. I know, it's hard. It, it yeah. is hard to answer that one. I mean, I think because traditionally as journalists or even contemporarily where you sort of take the approach of don't worry about the impact on me the people who were covering like it, it's mm -hmm. difficult enough for them exactly. I'm not going to complain yeah. about my stress or my psychological yeah. stress but there's times and I certainly found that with this season um, where it does it, it it catches up with you it can even blindside you um, and so I think just being really open with each other as a team about that mm -hmm. and knowing like okay this is not a good day today or this is not a good week I'm going to be working from home or I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, having a good, a good support system and good colleagues. And um, for me, I, I drew a lot of strength this season just from Cleo's family as well in my conversations with them mm -hmm. and talking to them about that, what they were dealing with and not necessarily sharing how I was feeling, but just I drew a lot of strength from that yeah. to keep going. Mm -hmm. Bill Stewart. Bill Stewart yeah. says, I'm a 60 Scoop survivor and I have been able to bring myself to listen. It's too painful. Mm -hmm. I totally understand, Bill, and I hope that you don't feel any pressure at all to listen because um, I think that we've heard from so many people who have no connection to this issue or this story in particular who said how difficult it is to hear. And I know that I said to my own family before it started, you know, because they were excited to listen and wanted to be supportive, um, just that 
that it's hard and that we don't like these are lived experiences for for some people uh, who are still dealing with this intergenerational trauma and you know we don't necessarily need to to listen in the same way so don't feel any pressure at all from us to to listen um, and just to take care uh, of yourself and and I mean hopefully there are supports that that you can reach out to to, to help you in that way and I think that I mean what's what's been helpful I think for some people I've heard is just connecting with other people who have similar issues or are going through similar things and and hopefully having that support is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, Jody Todd asks, I loved when you spoke with Nora Cummings. Did she communicate any of her follow or future plans or thoughts on this podcast to you? Mm -hmm. I haven't been in touch with Nora since the podcast aired. I loved Nora too. We, we spent a long time with her that morning in Saskatoon. She was fantastic and we talked about so much um, of her personal story which is which is fascinating and amazing and I wish we'd been able to include more of it. Um, but I know she is listening because when we were with her at her house that day, we actually took her iPhone and we, we subscribed her to the podcast. And then our other producer, Jen, uh, has been in touch with her since it launched. So I hope she's listening. It's a good reminder to follow up with her. Mm -hmm. Here's a good one for Connie. Oh gosh. Um, Elizabeth Clark, another question on Facebook. Love the insight into your own experience recording what did it really feel like knocking on Mrs. Madonia's door? I think I'm, I was pretty transparent about that <laughs> in the podcast. I really, I was really hesitant to do it. I really, um, I really felt uncomfortable doing that um, for all the reasons I said in the podcast. You know, uh, we had this time constraint where we actually, you know, we had this plane to get to get back to Canada, and you know, we had been trying to return, we hadn't, so we felt like it was necessary, but it also felt like, um, you know, just really rotten to be the person knocking on someone's door after so long and asking about their daughter that had that had died. Um, I don't, like, I've had to do that sometimes in other stories as well, um, and it, I don't think it feels very good at all. Uh, I don't. I, I obviously don't regret doing it. I think it was good. Marnie was very encouraging for me to get out the door. <laughs> That's a nice way to characterize it. Encouraging. I felt like they're really just. We had multiple pushy producer who was like, "Get out of the van! You've got to get out." You now. didn't see her kick me out at the, with her with her foot. No, we had so many conversations with like with the two of us, but also with our senior producer about how to do it and what is the best way. And we really tried as much as we could to be sensitive to. Um, Cleo's family, her adoptive family and her biological family when we were approaching them because these are really difficult truths that they have lived with and, and this is their real life, right? Like So um, that didn't feel great. No, and not knowing that she was having health issues as yeah. well, all of that. Like we just had no she idea was, we yeah. were completely going in cold. We had tried, yeah, after the fact to reach her son thinking it was maybe more appropriate to try to speak to him, but um, yeah, not not anything any journalist wants to have to do. It was a, an absolute yeah. last resort. Um, so Julia Carruthers Morden asks via CBC Indigenous, how do Christine and Johnny feel now? I bet you they I bet you they're there. I don't I, yeah. I can't see the Facebook Live, but I bet you Christine and Johnny are both there. They've been very active on social media. Um, so they they might want to answer that themselves. themselves. Um, I, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a tough one to answer for mm -hmm. them. I think it's Probably been quite a roller coaster ride, but we'll let them answer. Um, Janet see. Tingley Forsyth asks on Facebook: Some important people in this story were unable to discuss Cleo's story, her adoptive family. How do you get past the disappointment of being unable to add their narrative and understanding of Cleo to her story? Do you feel like her story can be complete without this essential dialogue? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I think that, like, obviously, we are so grateful for the people who chose to talk to us and to share what they knew with us. Um, but that's their choice, right? So, and this is, like we just said, this is their real life, and this is a difficult thing for anyone to talk about. And so. Um, I, I totally respect their decisions not to want to be involved. Um, do we feel like it can be complete? Like, I, I don't know if we'll ever, f this is not a fictional story, this is someone's real story, so I don't know that we'll ever know the full, mm -hmm. full story about what happened necessarily that day or that, you know, what led to that, like where did she, how many foster, like I have so many questions left about Cleo's story that I would love to be able to answer. Um, but I also feel like, amazed at how much we were able to uncover 
starting from basically nothing, like not mm -hmm. even knowing her name or birth date. And I think that's part of why, too, we felt it was important to include um, the interview with Mrs. Madonia and with Cleo's brother, adoptive brother, Lewis, in the final episode. Spoiler again. Um, because we weren't able to do those interviews with them in person and we felt that there, there was important insight from their mm -hmm. recollections of that day as well. So that was part of why we did that. Um, Amanda Ray asks on Facebook, what kind of impact were you hoping that the podcast would accomplish? Um, so Marty and I have been working together for th at least three years now on basically almost exclusively focused on this issue of, of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And I think if I look back on it now, I feel like all of the stories that we've done together, like starting from um, we d when we did the MMIW database for CBC and we started, we did an investi investigation into Leah Anderson's story and then we did uh, a story about Amber Tuckerow and Alberta Williams was the first season of the podcast and now Cleo. Um, I, I think that for, for we, my goal has been to try to connect the dots and to show how interconnected all of these issues are of in terms of all indigenous issues. So we're, you know, we're, there's a national inquiry happening right now. We're, there's been an increased focus on this issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in the news in the last few years. And, and I think that as a Cree woman who is really connected still to my family and my community, um, I think that my goal is to just try to show how all of these issues are really interconnected with each other, how it's related to residential schools and child welfare and the 60 Scoop, how it's related to poverty, the ongoing poverty and the lack of um, basic services in, in some Indigenous communities. And so I feel like it's not just the podcast that we've been trying to, to do that with. We've been doing stories over a number of years now. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything? Nothing, Nothing really to add, no. I mean, yeah, no, I think Connie, Connie more than covered it. Um, I lost where we are. I know. Okay. Um, Kath, Kathy Wilkerson okay. asks on Facebook, this podcast has literally changed me. Me too. Me too. My mother grew up uh, in a native boarding school in the U.S. Will you be continuing to focus on Aboriginal stories, Highway of Tears? Well, thanks so much for listening, yeah. Kathy. Um, I don't. I yes. I like we said. We don't really have um, a plan on what the next story is or what the next uh, thing will do. But uh, but I think that's definitely. I imagine that the, I, I want to continue um, telling stories from Indigenous communities, uh, whether or not it's a podcast or a story or how it what format it takes. I'm mm -hmm. not really sure. I still really don't know. I know. Well. It kind of goes to one of the earlier questions about what, what do you do to, to focus a part of it is I think we just needed to get to the finish line of finishing it and then yeah. take a little bit of a break before we decide what's, what's My next, next project is going to be finishing this blanket I'm knitting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to clean my fridge. <laughs> yep, that's about it. Um, so our moderators are saying, um, yeah, we, we've, I think we've, gone over time but we can keep going yeah, if you I'm going. Yeah, yeah I'm getting with something from Johnny See, Johnny I knew Johnny says, yeah. interesting hi guys hi um, thank you for letting me keep my promise to my sister oh you can't make us cry on a Facebook no. live <laughs> uh, I, I, I just have so much respect and admiration for for all of Cleo's siblings um, and just a thank you to all of you guys for mm -hmm. letting us be part of this mm-hmm um, yeah. Let's see. Any more questions? We don't have. I mean, we can. We can wrap up now. Yeah. That's fine. But if there's more. Oh. There's one here from Diane Bear. Diane Bear. Oh, do you think that this heartbreaking story will have any impact on the 60s scoop settlement? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I, have, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, I'm curious, I mean, just on the settlement, I'm curious about one thing that the government has set, I don't know how much money aside from that settlement, but to start some sort of foundation. It was 15 million. 50 million, something like that. And I don't know that this, that this dovetails with this story, that it would um, be as a result of this at all, but I mean, I would hope that somewhere in that, I don't know exactly the purpose of that foundation, but th there will be mechanisms for families to try to reunite people who are looking to reunite. Um, yeah, I, that's all I can say on that, really. Um, yeah, the settlement is still, 
I think it, yeah, still very much in the works as to whether it's even going to be accepted as a as an appropriate settlement. Yeah, well, that's something we'll have to we'll have to watch and see. But mm -hmm. I think that this is a good place to wrap up, and I just yeah. want to thank you guys for joining us today. And I'm very active on Twitter and Facebook, so if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me there. Um, and thanks to everyone at CBC News who yeah. organized this, and to Ed who thanks, guys. pressed the, the record button. <laughs> he did more than that. <laughs> thank <to> you. <laughs> He's the I'm a comedian. Sure. Yeah. I, I should <laughs> pursue that. Now we can have a sip of my coffee. I honestly thought you were going to say, now we can have a cigarette. What? You don't even smoke. I don't smoke. What?